Uh, we're glad to be together tonight in the eights. And, uh, you know, we're shifting up a little bit next week. We're going to do this particular thing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, although we will be starting uh, Compline, which is a uh, the evening prayer office. For those of you that are friends of St. Anthony, um, that's that group of folks in sanctuary and around the diocese that just are sort of dancing with this idea of praying using a breviary. Some of you have grown up maybe in a background where you never used one of these. Um, they're ancient. They've been around forever. This was actually a fairly new one. It was put together um, in the last couple of years by uh, the Anglican Church of North America. But if you've never used a breviary, they're basically a guide of prayer time. And uh, even though a lot of the prayers are written and you're praying them, you have to kind of think about it like singing a song, right? I mean, you can make up a song if you want, but a lot of the really wonderful songs that you can kind of unite your heart to are songs that are beautifully poetic and have a great, uh, you know, uh, um, sort of rhythm and, and uh, um musical line to it that you can enjoy and jump on same kind of thing so some of these prayers are just richly theological and wonderful to pray and and uh, it's a little odd for many of us brought up in in evangelical protestant charismatic traditions because we think they can't they're written so they can't be from the heart and i i think that, that that's just not true but for those of you that are experimenting with that, we welcome you on the eights in the morning. We walk through the Book of Common Prayer together. And even though it might be a little bit dry here and there, I think you'll find that it has a kind of sustaining quality to it. And then in the evenings, for those of us, or some of us that are not in the, just in the um, Friends of St. Anthony, we actually are part of the Order of St. Anthony, which is the neo-monastic community where people actually promise into or vow into praying uh, an office in the morning and an office in the evening or to kind of bookending their lives with prayer. And so for those of us, you know, we've been doing some of the eights, but to fulfill our kind of obligation, uh, we do just a little bit more. But um, so what we're going to do, if you'd like to join us, is for those of you that are in the Order of St. Anthony or those of you that are just friends or just of St. Anthony or just want to experience it, we're going to start doing Compline. It'll be at 9 p.m. So we'll invite you to join with us if you want to. It's about, it's a short one. It's like 10 minutes. So, um, but it's sweet. It kind of shuts up the day or shuts down the day. I'm not supposed to say shut up, Reverend Jenna says. She says, shut up, saying shut up is what she says. Or something like that, right? Is that what you do, Reverend Jenna? Be yeah. quiet, is that what you say? <laughs> so, what did she say, Father Brett? Yeah. Huh? It's repent. <laughs> okay, well, she's, I, I always love her being here because I, I don't really have a conscience. So I need people outside in my life to kind of remind me and bump me back in because my conscience is deeply seared. So anyway, tonight, we're glad that you're here with us. And uh, we have Kyle Wester, who is really a joy. He just recently joined the community a few months ago, uh, but I've known of him and known him for a long time. And uh, we are we are have been so fortunate to have he and his wife and family involved in sanctuary. And tonight uh, we invited him. He's a he's a counselor by trade, and um, so you might be able to he might be able to say something that'll fix you, right? At least Sarah says that might work, right? <laughs> but welcome, friend. And uh, just what what's on your heart? Well, how are you guys processing things? What would you like to share? Well, first, as a counselor, I would say I'm not going to fix anybody. <laughs> my job is help them fix themselves. Um, but yeah, no, my, my uh, thanks for having me, Ed. I appreciate you letting me get, get a chance to talk to everybody. So my expertise, everyone, is, is typically related to parents and kids. But what I try to do today is make this information helpful for parents, couples, people that are single, all across the board. Okay. So um, first, I want to do, I do want to start out, though, with a joke. So um, there's an author named Gary Thomas and something he talks about the saints, right? And he, he points out that something interesting about the saints is all of them are single. Yeah. And so he points out that it's, it's kind of easy to be a saint when you're not married and don't have kids. Yeah, it's a little easier because <laughs> when you're married and you have kids, there's so many more opportunities to not be saintly. You know, it, it brings up a lot of conflict. So, so part of that, I start with that joke because I want to think it is true. There is a lot of friction, a lot more friction that can happen when you're married and you have kids. 
And so I wanted to specifically look at these unique times that we're in where we are gathered together, you know, much more compact than normal, spending a lot more time together. Um, and even I was thinking about the conflict that not only is happening in our homes, book and Instagram. I mean, there's, there's conflict that, it, that seems to be popping up all over the place more than I, I would typically see it, you know? Um, and so when I say that I believe that conflict is an opportunity, I want to qualify that first because it's, I don't want this, I'm, I don't want this to be seen as like a, take this opportunity while you're quarantined and, and get better. I, I don't really want to approach it that way. I, will, I more want you to see conflict as an opportunity for a path that you get to choose. Okay. So anytime I'm faced with conflict, whether that's a conflict between me and my three-year-old or a conflict between me and God, um, or a conflict even between me and myself, um, I, I think we have two opportunities, two, two different ways to go with that. I can either move or I can pull away from it and create isolation, all right? So I want you just to think about that for a moment. Think about seeing all conflict in your life as an opportunity. So first, just take that in. And then kind of take note of what do you tend to do? Do you tend to pull away from the conflict or do you tend to lean into it? Okay. Because conflict for the most part, for most people, even just in general in church, conflict is normally seen as really bad or at least inconvenient. Okay. And when conflict arises in our families, in ourselves, on Facebook, on Instagram, there's typically a most people have not seen conflict to be an opportunity towards moving towards somebody. It's typically been something that's been a catalyst to push people away, to separate people, to isolate people, to make people feel alone and, and, and different, you know? But I believe God has created us to grow and mature through conflict. For some reason, I did to make that the way in which we come into the world. I mean, think about birth, what a conflict that is. Think about even becoming pregnant, what a conflict that is, right? I mean, all, all these ways in which friction brings about life. Somehow God seems to be about friction, people coming together, and then there's a choice we get to make. Um, we get to either pull back apart or we get to lean into it further, okay? I mean, even, I'm even thinking about, man, as, as my daughter who's, who's 10, I mean, you see these kids as they're growing up, my oldest, how they go through growing pains. You know, even that's a conflict, like their body growing and shape. You think about teenagers as they start to hit all these big physical changes emotionally and physically. There's a lot of conflict that arises through that time. But if you could see conflict as an avenue, a pathway for transformation, I think it changes everything for you, okay? Um, so I, I want you to hold that thought and then I wanna switch gears and we'll come back to it. So we know through brain science that we are interpersonal creatures, okay? From the time we are born, we come into this world looking around and seeing who's there because we need people to help us understand ourselves, okay? Immediately, I'm looking around to see, is this a safe world? Is this a dangerous world? Can I grow in this world? Can I be accepted by you in this world? Um, and then there's this interesting that God even put in our brains. I don't know if you've ever heard of this neurologic called mirror neurons, where even if, if I'm walking towards you and you're smiling at me, I want to smile back at you. Like my brain actually wants to connect with you that way and create the intimacy. You know, I love this quote from a, a Catholic monk named Thomas Merton. He says, we come to know who we are in the context of others. So just sit with that quote for a second. We come to know who we are in the context of it. So I, I, I like to think of that almost like, like a name. Like if you were to say Kyle, um, that could mean a lot of different things to you. But then if I said my name within a sentence, you'd have a better idea about who Kyle may be. But if you put that name within a paragraph or in a chapter of a book or an entire novel, you could have a better understanding of who Kyle is and so would I, of who I am. Because it's through those interactions, through those conflicts, that I begin to get formed and shaped, and I get to know who I am in Christ. Okay, so, so, so with that idea, there's this really neat neurological thing that happens whenever we're approaching somebody or coming towards somebody, okay? So hold this quote for a second, okay? What you offer to others is a gift to yourself, okay? Or you could say it a different way. What you offer others will be strengthened in yourself. Okay, so, so I, I don't know if you know this, but you know, in physics, 
if I have an object, like if I, if I had an object and I handed it to you, like let's say it was a marker, you now have the marker. So the marker is no longer in my hands, it's in your hands. So that's a physical change from the matter being in my hand to yours. But thoughts don't work that way. Thoughts actually don't go from me to you. Okay. Now, now we are these interpersonal creatures, so you can be impacted by my thoughts, but my thoughts stay with me. And so actually in my brain, if I'm thinking negative thoughts about you, that actually hurts me. So every time I judge you harshly, I actually judge myself harshly. I actually literally in my brain, my serotonin and dopamine levels will go down and my cortisol or my stress hormones will go up and I will feel less good about myself because I'm with you. You know, that's typically why we like to be with people we like, because when we like people, we tend to like ourselves when we're with those people we like. That's why we don't want to hang out with people that we tend to have negative impressions of. Or, or if I'm sitting with a bunch of people and I think all these people are idiots, which of course I would never think that. But if I was thinking that, I would actually be discouraged myself by being around all these people. Now translate that, not just from a, a church setting or a social setting, but translate that to a family setting. You know, now if I'm approaching my kids with that kind of idea or my wife with that idea, that what I offer to them will be strengthened in me. You know, that, that, that's a different type of conflict, right? It's a different type of conflict altogether. So now I want to give you an example of how this works. So, so let's say my kids are acting unenjoyable. Okay, typically what happens, my mirror neurons will want to then act unenjoyable. So I will come back at their not being enjoyable and you'll probably find I won't be that enjoyable. It actually takes some real conscious effort to use this conflict to create some intimacy rather than isolation, where instead of approaching them as if they are an enjoyable, this is the moment I need to approach them as if they are. Because originally there was a time when I approached them as if they were enjoyable, they hadn't done a thing that was enjoyable. All they did was wake me up at night. All they did was take from my sleep. They took my money, they took my time. They actually weren't all that enjoyable, but I enjoyed them nonetheless. And I would say that's how they became enjoyable. I mean, think about that even when scripture tells us that, that we, are, we, we love because we were first loved. I only believe I am lovable because someone first loved me. My mom one day held me and said, I love you, son. And that's why I even believe I could be loved, right? So, so in these moments when my kid is being unenjoyable, or unlovely, that is the very moment I need to bring in love and joy for them. You know, there's one story I, I like to tell my clients. One day, I don't know if you ever had this, I've got a 10, a seven, and a three-year-old. Sometimes they don't like food, and that can be very frustrating because you go to all this work to make this food, and then they don't want to eat that food. And so that can be annoying. So I was kind of tired of this interaction, so I thought I'm going to take them to a foolproof place to get some food they will like, so I took them to Chick-fil-A, because that's a foolproof solution. We get to Chick-fil-A, and on this one day, it was totally a test of God, because my kids did not like the food at Chick-fil-A, and I was, oh, I was so frustrated, because this was a foolproof plan, and it fell apart, and I noticed in that moment, just when I was about to give this lecture about what ungrateful kids they are, I began to think about what is gratitude. Gratitude is accepting and appreciating something, even when it isn't what I would like it to be sometimes. And I thought, that's exactly what I want the kids to do with the Chick-fil-A food, but I'm actually not doing it with them in this moment. I'm actually not grateful for them. And yet I'm going to tell them to be something I am not willing to be. So maybe in this moment when they're being ungrateful, maybe the very approach I need to take is to be grateful, is I need to sit down and look at these kids who I get the joy of raising and parenting, even when they don't like Chick-fil-A food, which is mind-blowing. And maybe if I show them gratitude, even in that moment when they seem to be something that I wish they weren't maybe they become something I would like them to be, okay? So I wanna wrap this up by saying all of this. Um, if, if you've never read a book, there's a book called um, Anatomy of the Soul, where Dr. Kurt Thompson, he's a psychiatrist who takes all of this kind of brain science stuff from a guy named Dr. Siegel, and he shows how God has set up the spiritual disciplines to actually do this for us too. Like where we, when we use the spiritual disciplines, like reading the word, like praying, like worship, I mean, you go down the list. Each of these are ways in which we approach God and allow God to see us in a certain way and for us to see him in a certain way, which actually transforms us into what he sees us as, okay? So N.T. Wright kind of talks about this original vocation that we all had. And that vocation was to reflect the glory of God. So I, I want to leave you with this last kind of thought about conflict. 
what if these conflictual moments, what if the trap we get into when our kids or our wives or people on Facebook are acting in a way we don't like, what if when we treat them back the way they are treating us, what if all we're doing is reflecting ourselves? What if that moment could be a transformational moment where I instead turn not towards them, but towards God and allow God to be reflected back to them where they are loved and enjoyed just as they are. And then that's how the conflict will create the intimacy that it was meant for all along. So, so, so just kind of ending this whole thought, I love this quote that parenting for me is my transformational vocation. So marriage may be your transformational vocation. You know, a friendship may be your transform, transformational vocation. But I, I, I'm trying to ask you to think about in this time, what is the way, what is the vocation, what, what is the transformational avenue that God is using for you then to reflect the glory of God back to the world? Okay. Nice. Thank you so much, Kyle. I, uh, if any of you want to give a reflection on that, what you're making me think of, friend, is the... Um, is the way in which sometimes people use um, knowledge or their faith or whatever prayer to try to control the world. Yeah. Um, and, um, but there is a way in which I think what you're talking about has a servant kind, beautiful kind of control that isn't the intention isn't to control the person, yeah. but more to create the environment that's loving and to have a sense that you can actually influence that. And I'm, I'm thinking of the text that most of you know, let me put it up on the screen here, where Paul makes this claim, uh, do not be conceived, God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let's not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. But that kind of notion of like a farmer can kind of predict the future of soil by the seed the farmer chooses to put in the soil, right? That I think it's so hopeful to recognize our faith, though it's not ever designed to manipulate or control or force people into outcomes. There really is something we can do that can kind of, you know, cause the environment that we're in to be different and to be wonderful. And, and in that sense, we have a kind of control that isn't rooted in selfishness, yeah. but it's rooted in a kind of sense of, um, of uh, acting in a way that opens the door for the spirit to be involved. And it's a beautiful thing, but that's very hopeful, I think, to, yeah. to realize that we can actually do something about toxic yeah. environments, right? Uh, who else? Yeah. You want to respond to that, Kyle? No, no I, I was just going to say the hopeful aspect for me, Ed, was yeah, it used to be before I caught onto this idea was conflict was something I wanted to make go away. So if the kids were acting in a way or life was acting in a way or I was acting in a way that I did not want to be, it was to resist. It was to push down. It was to control instead of just receiving it. And then I get to choose how I want to then come back to that. And yeah. so instead of focusing on what I don't want, I get to focus on what I do want. And then I yes. just bring that into the world. So I very much see the connection of even the kingdom of God. Like if my kids are acting this way, I can just even think what kind of fruit of the spirit would I like to see right now? I just want yeah. to bring some peace right now. So it's not dictated by a three-year-old how the world is going to be at this moment. I get to say, this is how I want to show up right now. I want to bring peace to this moment. And that's yes. what I want to bring to her. You know? Well, and the flip side of that idea of control is the idea of always constantly being victimized. And yes. you know, the yep. idea yep. that I am a victim of my circumstances and yep. why doesn't the world change so that I can be happier? I yep. mean, you really, these thoughts are really empowering to say, hey, wait a minute. We can act in certain ways that will flip this. We don't have to be victims of our um, three-year-olds. Yes. I'm so glad yep. I don't have any three-year-olds right now. Oh, Praise you're missing out. Lord. You're missing no, out. No, no, I, so no I, 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 I have been there and I know you have. we have fully immersed in yes. that. And we are, yes. I'm hoping Gil doesn't get pregnant, actually, as we're, we're talking here. Uh, so anyone, anyone else, a thought or comment? I, I have a question. Yes, Father Paul. 
Who your name is Ed Gunger on there? Are you like a poser or something? We know you're not. Yeah, it's called plausible deniability. <laughs> um, Kyle, one of the very first things yeah. you mentioned was that when conflict happens, we are e either uh, we either tend to engage with it or disengage with it. Yeah. Uh, Enneagram nine here, yeah. and there's a couple yeah. of us here on the call. Um, so obviously my tendency is to just disengage from it and yeah. let it be and hope it resolves itself. What, uh, what would you say to people in terms of how to think about engaging, um, kind of flipping that switch from yeah. rather always wanting to disengage to finding ways to engage? Yeah, I think actually, I, I wish my wife could answer that for you because she's a nine too, Paul. <laughs> and since, since I, I am an eight, that's a typical issue that comes up. <laughs> so, so, so typically, yes, I, I, love, I lean in hard, sometimes too hard, to where I push the person away by trying to move if, in. If I'm you like, guys have here. never done, if you guys have never done any Enneagram work, you need to do some because that was quite a phenomenal comment Kyle made. A nine married to an eight is quite, an, yes. it's quite an experience. <laughs> well, and so, so, so Paul, to your point, I, I would say early on in our marriage that the dynamic was my force would begin pushing and Sarah would just go, whoa, <laughs> just kind of push back. And so, so what, what Sarah has gotten so much better, we've been married almost 18 years now, what she's gotten so much better is, is not, um, is, is believing that her voice does matter. And so, so through the conflict, she has learned to trust that I want to hear what she has to say. That is, I mean, even just recently, Paul, just even a couple of days ago, we had some conflict about school and her text message literally said, I have some anger that's been building up. I want to express it for you. Could you make sure your eight is kind of under control when I express it? And of course, my, my thought is express it. I want you to bring it. Bring it. I love this. Tell me what you're going through because it's only through that we can really grow and change, honey. And it was awesome. Like if, if, she, if she prefaces that way, Paul, that then I'm much more thoughtful about um, receiving it rather than reacting to it. And, and because I want to cultivate and grow a relationship where she feels safe enough to show up with all of her nine-ish and be completely accepted for it because her voice is so important as, as is yours. So, so I think for the nine, it's very much, I've got to cultivate that trust that my voice needs to be heard. It is important. I need to show up. Beautiful. Anyone else, a thought, comment, question? Uh, 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 Joseph actually said, hey, Joseph, said that you had a great joke there, Kyle. So oh, he, thanks, Joseph. He, he was uh, hoping you'd do another one. Man. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, a little stand-up comedy. Or oh, something. first of all, uh, just love this. This is great. Uh, did a great job with this. And, uh, you know, we, we deal with marriage stuff so much that, uh, and trying to help couples recognize a conflict is inevitable, you know, and not to, not to fear it. Now, certain personalities fear it more than others. And so we spend a lot of our time coaching couples in kind of a way that helps uh, nines and others that are going to shy away to feel safe. And it helps eights and others to have guardrails so that if I can kind of follow this path, I'm not going to run over anybody, you know. Uh, but I just love the way you talked about, you know, uh, being present with people, um, uh, not based on where they're at. I, I love the C.S. Lewis quote that we use with couples quite a bit. Uh, we talk about love. He says, love is an action, not a feeling. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets when you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you, Father Brown. Lovely. One more? We're running out of time. Yeah, I have like a, just kind of a, a short story that kind of goes along with this. Um, one of my children, one of the many herds, um, <laughs> At one point, like he, he was in this, I'm sure those that, you know, had children know that sometimes they go through these phases where like they need 
energy from you. And so anytime they're around you or they touch you, it's like they're sucking the life out of you because they're, they're just needing there. And so there's just um, this point in life where um, our younger son was in that he just needed time, but he wanted to give affection. And so he would always come up behind me and rub my shoulders but I could just feel like I could feel my energy just leaving me when he's like, he's sitting there trying to love on me. And it just, I mean, it would just, you know, it's like somebody you don't like touches you and you just, oh, you just like cringe away. I'd find myself kind of cringing away from his touch. And I, I heard in my heart, let him love you. Um, like I just heard, I was just like, good. God was like, just let him. And so I just, you know, kind of like to what Brent was saying, if you act, you know, act in love towards your neighbor, you will come to love them. So as I allowed him to experiment with giving affection, he has now become such like the peace when he touches you, you just feel so much peace in his hands. Oh. And sometimes he'll come up behind me and put his hand on my shoulder and I'll think it's my husband. Like he mm. carries the same amount of love and just life in him now. It's just, you know, if, if I hadn't listened, I, I would have robbed him of something. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's beautiful, Misty. So it, it, what you're really saying is to be anointed as a parent, you, you ha you're you anointed to be near the life suckers. Mm. That is awesome. <laughs> anointed to allow them to <laughs> suck the life out of you. Exactly. And know uh, that the life never actually leaves you. It's just exactly. this never It just feels like course. it. <laughs> But all things God turn constantly around. constantly gives. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's, our time is up. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's, it's, it, you're always a joy to us. We're delighted you're on. Thank you all for being on tonight. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, if you'd like to join us to do some praying and uh, uh, ask God with some great prayers to change the world, we invite you to do that. And until then, may the blessing of God be upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Godspeed to all of you.